In a world where the refractor reigns supreme, king of telescopes. <laughs> I can't go on. That's some nonsense a few persons first tried to convince me of a few years ago when I was first going back into astrophotography after a long hiatus from university days. And I, I don't know how that rumor got started. One of these days I'm going to have to address this idea that the refractor is the king of telescopes. But this video, obviously, is about the schmidt cassegrain telescope, my favorite telescope design, and one which derivations of are favored by many professional observatories, including organizations like NASA, the Hubble Telescope, and the James Webb Telescope, among many of the other most powerful telescopes in the world, are variations of the cassegrain telescope design. And there's a reason for it. It is a super fun, happy time, focal length and aperture machine. Now, in the amateur telescope world, the company probably most known for the schmidt cassegrain telescope is Celestron. It was, I think, closely followed by Mead, and then after that, Orion, at least here in North America. Unfortunately, both Mead and Orion have gone belly up and are no longer with us. It's quite a shame. I, I've never owned a Mead telescope, but I heard they were quite good. And I'd been contemplating getting one for when I finally start building the next observatory. Now, the schmidt cassegrain telescope is a very interesting design. It pulls off some of its amazing optical feats by folding the light path. At the very front of the telescope, there is a large lens, known as the corrector plate. The corrector plate is not a lens in the sense of a lens on a refractor telescope, however, it doesn't serve really anything like a light collection purpose. Its purpose is to reshape light waves so that they are reflected off the primary mirror at the back of the telescope without aberrations. That large primary mirror is found at the back of the telescope's body, and in many ways it's not much different from the large primary mirror you would find, say, in a Newtonian telescope. And this is where the power of the telescope's aperture comes into play. A small schmidt cassegrain telescope would be 5 or 6 inches in diameter, or about 150 millimeters. And insofar as I know, the average or typical schmidt cassegrain telescope, at least the one marketed to the astrophotography market by Celestron, and that was formerly marketed by Mead and Orion, was the 8-inch or 203mm telescope. So, you can see that even with the small schmidt cassegrain telescope at 150mm, you are getting a lot of aperture as a starting place with this telescope design. Especially when compared to refractors, where it's not at all unusual to find refractors as small as 50mm being used for astrophotography, and it's quite rare to find a 200mm refractor. They would be very expensive, costing anywhere from four to 10 times an SCT of that aperture. Light is folded back from the primary mirror up to a secondary mirror, which on a schmidt cassegrain telescope is mounted right into the corrector plate, which makes it super stable. For example, with a Newtonian telescope, which also has a secondary mirror, the orientation of the secondary frequently has to be corrected in a process known as collimation. In contrast, I've had my Celestron 203mm SET sitting on my mount and actively working outside in the observatory for about a year now. And it's out there non-stop, whether it's hot, cold, it lives in the observatory. And the collimation today is as good as when I bought it three or four years ago. I have literally not had to touch collimation in all that time, and it doesn't show any signs of needing a change or an adjustment anytime soon either. Whereas with Newtonian telescopes, you really should check your collimation every new night that you use it. I'm not trying to scare anybody away from Newtonian telescopes, by the way. With the right tools and a little patience, collimation honestly isn't that difficult. It's a little tedious, but it's not really difficult. Light is then folded from the secondary mirror back toward the image train. And this is where the SET design of telescope starts to act more like a refractor than a reflector like perhaps a Newtonian telescope. With a Newtonian telescope, the light would be bounced forward, off a secondary mirror and angled out the side of the telescope near the front of the telescope. But with an SCT, the light is collected at the back, like with a refractor. But it's at the secondary mirror where the SCT works its focal length magic. Now, not all Cassegrain telescopes are Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes. Some Cassegrains have concave secondaries, some have larger or smaller secondaries, and some have additional lenses in the light path. But the Celestron version of the Cassegrain is a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And it has a convex secondary, and the secondary lens is crucial because it does more than redirect light, it reshapes it. It broadens the trajectory of the light, which results in a wider image circle. As you can see in the image above, the secondary mirror is convex. Please bear in mind though that nothing in this illustration is to scale. 
I am portraying shapes and distances somewhat exaggerated for illustrative purposes. So the light bounces off the primary mirror, lands on the convex secondary mirror, and the secondary mirror sends the light to the back of the telescope. But the slight convexity of the secondary mirror also angles that light slightly outward, so that when the light reaches the focus plane, it's wider than it would be without the convex curvature. In other words, the light comes into focus at a wider image circle, and a wider image circle is literally what magnification is. Now, the primary mirror of the C8 telescope has a focal length of 400 millimeters. The secondary mirror effectively widens the path of the light five times, making the image circle five times the primary mirror's focal length, resulting in that magnificent 2032 millimeter focal length, roughly 10 times the telescope's aperture, as well as five times the total physical length of the telescope. And so the answer to the mystery of how the SET seems to pull focal length out of thin air is that the secondary mirror effectively serves the role of a Barlow lens. In the case of a telescope such as the C8, a very powerful 5X Barlow lens. However, the light path doesn't really look like what I'm showing in this illustration here. I'm simply showing it this way to illustrate through exaggeration how the light path expands, thereby magnifying the image. In truth, the light path probably looks more like this. After the Barlow-like magnification effect of the secondary mirror, the light coalesces into a focal point where the image inverts, somewhere down the image train. A few persons have messaged me by way of YouTube, and by few I mean I could count them all on one hand with some fingers left over, to tell me, and sometimes very angrily, that no, the light inverts between the primary mirror and the secondary mirror. So since I'm posting this illustration of the light path from an SET, and I expect those kind of posts to come up again, I'm going to note something. On the 8-inch Schmidt-Cassegrain SET known as the C8, the focal length of the primary mirror is 400 millimeters. However, I have attempted to measure the distance between the primary mirror and the secondary, and the distance is definitely less than 400 millimeters. The only way to get a precise measurement would be to open up the telescope, but I'm a big believer that if it ain't broke, don't fix it, so I'm not going to do that. However, measuring it from the outside, the secondary mirror appears to be at the very most 36 centimeters from the primary mirror and probably considerably less. Images from light do not invert until after they cross the focal point, meaning that the image cannot invert between the primary mirror and the secondary mirror. The primary mirror begins the inversion, but it can't invert at the secondary mirror. Therefore, the inversion of the image must happen somewhere down the light path between the secondary mirror and the image train. Now, if you want to see a very good demonstration of where along a light path an image reflecting off a concave mirror actually inverts, there are two simple but excellent videos that cover it from a channel called Physics Demo. The videos are Concave Mirror Demo and Concave Mirror Demo Pendulum, and the links to both those videos are provided in the description of this video. Now, I'm not an optical engineer, so if you're an authority on the subject and you have better information than what I can provide here, please let me know. I, I'd love to know if there is something in how this works that I am not seeing, but right now, the math insofar as I understand optical math works like this. But if you have any reliable information on where the image inverts, I would sure love to know. I know a definitive answer to this question is not going to be earth shattering. It's not going to really change how we do astrophotography, but I find it an interesting bit of trivia. Doubtless, the answer varies a little bit too, depending on what model of cast grain telescope you're looking at, because like we also covered earlier, there are several models of cast grain telescope. But who knows, maybe my measurements of where the elements are within the optical tube are in error. It's entirely possible. Like I said, I didn't take it apart. I hope you found this video interesting and even perhaps useful for you. I make them because I'm always interested in understanding the physics and the mechanics behind the optical elements and other equipment that we use. To me, the more knowledge you acquire, the better you understand astrophotography theory, and that often translates in unexpected ways into being able to improve your ability to capture images of the night sky. And if you have any thoughts, observations, or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. We finally, after about two weeks, have blue skies again. It's morning right now. I'm really hoping this persists till tonight because I really want to get back to my horse head project. If, if you're not already aware, I've been shooting the Horsehead Nebula with a particular goal of trying to make one of the most accurate images of the Horsehead Nebula ever obtained with an earthbound amateur telescope. I'm trying to take advantage of the dark skies where I live and the semi-unique set of circumstances that I have to be able to acquire that image. 
And if you'd like to see this ongoing project for yourself, pop over to the Sky Story Astro Bin. The link is also in the description below. Now, have a blast doing astrophotography. Learn something about that wonderful universe that we live in, which is revealed to us in the night sky right overhead. And get out there and shoot the sky.